folks, I'm Nathan with Two Guys Riding. Today we're out here at St. Cloud, Minnesota. We're out here at the Pantanos Car Show and we're here uh, with Warner from the Antique Car Club in St. Cloud. Correct. So, uh, there is a little known history about the pan car. Let's start with the background. So, who was it that created the pan car? A man named Samuel Pandolfo. Uh, started out selling insurance down in the southwestern start of the part of the country. Okay. But somehow got the idea that he could build a better car than the ones he could buy. Uh, he was a traveling salesman, and uh, he had all he had all kinds of problems with the cars he was buying, and he thought I can do better than that. So he started a company, uh, the Pan Motor Company. Uh, and that was up here in St. Cloud. Well, they actually started it, I believe, in, in uh, <clears throat> Michigan. Excuse me. Okay, Michigan was the first location. Yeah, and uh, he gets started, and then he he decided to pick. You know, now I got a company. Where am I going to land with it? Okay. I, oh, I got to have, got to have a place to park it, and uh, so he he was pretty smart. He took a look around, and this is a good area uh, as far as. Waters is concerned. The Mississippi River is on one side of us over here. It's a good area for forestry. Uh, there's woods all around here at that time, especially. Uh, you need wood and, uh, to build one of the old cars. They're framed with wood. And uh, he thought there was plenty of uh, opportunity for employment here. Uh, and there wasn't a lot. I mean, St. Cloud was relatively small at that time. Quite small, yes. And he actually built the factory outside of St. Cloud. Well, it was a very, yeah, it was very, very limit of St. Cloud. Uh, and he had, he was, he had great ideas. He was, he was a great idea man. Maybe his ideas were, were too good. And, uh, and we will get to those because they are really unique on the, on the pan car. Um, but he actually built a whole town around the factory well the whole the whole northwest area of, of St. Cloud commonly referred to as Pantown uh, we can get on a, on a city bus and, and get a ride and uh, it, the, the flyer on the bus will say Pantown and it'll take you up to the northwest part of the city uh, so it's still a commonly used term in St. Cloud. It's commonly used. I bet you the majority of the people living here now have no idea why it's called Pantown. But we try to help that out with our car club by kind of, kind of pushing the, the name Pan and uh, with the fact that there was an automobile company here in St. Cloud, uh, which is kind of unique. Not every town had one. Well, it is, and had it, uh, obviously it, it did not, uh, it didn't continue for too many years. There's enough years to produce some cars, but there, then there was some legal squabbles, and eventually it was shut down. That's about it, yeah. He, uh, he got in trouble for some of his advertising. Okay. And uh, Henry Ford, between Henry Ford and... Uh, the other big auto manufacturers, General Motors, why uh, they had no love for, for Mr. Pandolfo uh, or any competition that he might be able to generate. So uh, so there might have been a little mischief between the uh, three companies, or the uh, two companies helping this one not to succeed. That's correct. When, when World War I hit, of course, chaos reigned and uh, but Henry Ford managed to tie up all the steel production, uh, and General Motors chipped in with Henry Ford, and they kind of buried Penn Motor Company and Mr. Pandolfo, and then uh, they sued him for some false advertising, and uh, yeah, you know, things went on from there. It didn't get any better. He, he didn't have. Uh, the resources to fight either General Motors or Henry Ford. So did he eventually end up then going to jail or did he just shut the company down and disappear? No, the company was sold. Uh, 
stockholders kind of took over the company. Okay. And at one point in time, and I uh, there's a big investment company that's on the market yet today that actually was the last owner of Pan Motor Company. Okay. Uh, on paper, so they uh, you know they tried to save it. They they had the money to save it. But like I say, General Motors and Henry Ford. Uh, they didn't want to see it happen. Had no part of that. So one more one more question about the history, and then we're going to talk about some of the beautiful uh, pan cars that you have here. So uh, are there any l structures from the original uh, pan motor company in St. Cloud that are still in existence today? There are. There are. Okay. Quite a, there are. There are quite a few. There's a, the, the biggest. Building is, is still being used today. That uh, it was owned by a uh, refrigerator manufacturer for many years. And that the front of the building has all been re redone. Up until that time, the, the building looked just like it did in 1917. Nobody ever else ever changed it. It sat empty during during World War II for the most part. Okay. And then, uh, you know, then it, it it got picked up and. Uh, Manufacturing picked up, of course, and uh, so it's uh, it's been owned by several different manufacturers. Okay, but it's still in existence. Now yeah, we were main, talking. The main building is still in existence. Uh, the power plant that, that generated all the power for the, the, the manufacturing that building is still in existence. It's quite a ways off off a track, uh, and there's. Uh, a variety of, of, the, of the homes that, uh, that Mr. Pandolfo got started with his home and a lot of others that along 8th Street North okay. uh, were part of the original Pan group. So, and I understand that they actually built tunnels from one building to another, so it, it just made it easier, I suppose, during the winter. <laughs> and there weren't a lot of streets out here. This was kind of prairie ground. Well, yeah, you, there, there was a streetcar, I think, that ran out this far in the later years. I don't think it, when 07 or when things were getting started, there was anything. But, yeah, there was, there was interconnected underground tunnels to all the buildings. And, uh, of course, that helped them with uh, plumbing chases and, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, he had lots of good ideas. Uh, you know, things that were innovative or, or up to the minute in, in that period of time. In fact, quite, quite modern. So some of the stuff we don't see till many, many years later, right? Right, but that's common. Uh, All right, so let's, let's talk about um, this PAN car right here. This is the 1919 PAN Model A. Uh, this is the PAN Model A, they called it, and uh, it was the starship of the company at that time, it, it, it had to make make it in the market, or they weren't gonna weren't gonna succeed. Survive. Although they had plans for a, a couple other cars, there's some pictures around of a, a later model uh, Pan Roadster. Okay. I understand they only built one of those. I actually knew a fellow that claims he saw that car in the flesh, so we know that probably did exist. Huh. Like I say, Mr. Pandolfo had a lot of foresight, but he was, you know, maybe a little too ambitious. All right, so on the Model A, the 1919 Pan Motor Model A, let's talk about some of those unique features, because they are really interesting, starting with the back. Well, so they, you know, they had a compartment box in the back that uh, held not only gas and water, but also there were other compartments. You could put your lunch back there. Or you, uh, you could put you know, toolbox. And there was a toolbox. And there was a cool. supply of oil because those old engines consumed a lot of oil. So five different compartments: oil, water, coolant, a cooler, <laughs> and a toolbox. All in that little area. All in that compartment. Okay. So. On, on the liquids, oil, water, coolant. It wasn't a storage area that you set a container in. Rather, you actually dumped the fluid in. And was there something at the bottom to open up? Each one of those compartments had a spigot that you opened up. 
<laughs> wow. Okay, well that's very interesting because most manufacturers at that time didn't, didn't have, well none, <laughs> none had that, right? He uh -huh. used that tiny small space that everyone put a cargo rack on and said, put a steam trunk on there. Yep. All right, so moving to the front, there's a unique feature with the headlights. That's correct. The headlights will actually uh, turn in their, in their positions, in their hole, where they sit. But they will turn around, so if you have to, if you got stopped out in the middle of nowhere in the, at night, you could turn a headlight around and shine it into the engine compartment and then see what you were doing or what you weren't going to be able to accomplish. <laughs> wow! Instant uh, engine compartment light and a bright one, too. Pretty bright for the time, that's correct. No, I don't think any other manufacturers ever came up with that idea. Yeah, I don't think so. The uh, On the interior, there were two things that I noticed that were pointed out to me. One is the seats. Tell us about what the seats do in that model. In, in this model, you can fold the seats down and actually make a double bed. Well, what they considered to be a double bed at that time. Right, because there wouldn't have been a lot of hotels around in 1919 along the, tra the highways. Well, you have to remember that 1912, 1913, 1910 even, uh, a lot of these salespeople traveled a little bit long distances. If you broke down uh, halfway between Albuquerque and some, you know, Podunkville, why, uh, you might have to stop for the night. And he was a traveling salesman, so he, he would have experienced all these things, hence all the compartments in the back. I wonder how many times he ran out of oil. <laughs> <laughs> okay, also, on the stick shift, it's reverse pattern. I, I, I can't remember why he did that anymore. You know, I, I know there was a reason why, but I don't remember why. I, well, think, I, I think it was to locate the shift lever out, better out of the way of a passenger. passenger? Yeah. That's kind of what it looks like when you look at where it's located. Going, if he, if you did the normal pattern, that last shift into third gear would be in your passenger's lap. Yep. Yep. And this way, it was down right by your knee and in between you. Right. It's a guess, but I mean, it's that's pretty it's much common sense guess. Yeah, that's a pretty much pretty good definition of you know of the, the why and the wherefore of that. The club here owns this green one. You also have another 1919 Model A um, that is... Red. Red. A red one. And that, you know, is, it's unique, I guess, Warner, that a club actually owns cars. Usually <laughs> they're individually owned, but you've, your club has worked really hard to preserve the history. That's our objective, right. Um, so you actually have two fully restored cars, and they work. These are driven Right? Right. And you share them with the uh, the local uh, history center and museum? Yeah. Tell us about the, I think this is the P250 next to us. It, it's, uh, I'll call it a rust bucket. <laughs> right? It's, it's well, got uh, no wheels, uh, you know, no tires on it, I mean. It's all rusted out. The engine, half the engine sitting on the floor. But what is this? Well, it was the Pan Model 250. Okay. Uh, and it didn't. It wasn't much different than the Pan Model A. It, it's kind of interesting that we obtained this car because uh, somehow the word got out that there was a man up in North Dakota that had Pan Motor Company parts in a car. But before we got to him, he had sold the engine to someone down in uh, the Colorado Springs area. But we ended up with everything but that engine, okay. and uh, basically a pile of sheet metal, and uh, we were able to put together uh, most of it. The, uh, the cowl section that's on the car now is not for a Pan Model 250, it's for a Pan Model A. Okay. They were quite similar to the cars. Uh, there's a big difference in the way the the cutouts for the, the doors, but other than that, my, uh, we were managed to, by putting a cowl section on it, we could put a radiator uh, and, a, and a hood and uh, all the things it takes to make it look like a car. Do you have any idea why, you know, why did he call it the P250? I mean, here you got Model A's, you got Model 2. Why P250? 
I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I was it no the idea. number he was going to manufacture? Or? <laughs> okay, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. <laughs> it's, a mystery. Yeah, um, it's a mystery for me, at least. Yeah, well, if it's a mystery to you, Warner, it's a mystery to everybody else. You are probably the foremost knowledgeable person on the fan car. Some of our early club members that were uh, had the foresight to to dig, to dig, dig into that and, and deserve the history of of the Pan Automobile and the Pan Motor Company. And that's the, that's what your club does. I mean, that's that's a part of your club's mission. That's correct. So. I mean, you think about it, St. Cloud could have been another Detroit. That potential was there. The potential was there. And Mr. Pandolfo would have been just tickled pink to uh, have made it work that well. And uh, definitely a man ahead of his time as far as the design and the elements on his car. I mean, he put his experiences on the road into his manufacturing. That's correct. You know, well, Warner, thank you so much for taking your time to share with us this really unique and, and very interesting history about the um, Pan Motor Company. We really appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you for coming by. Uh, thank you for your interest. Thanks for watching.